Welcome back to the 12 Days in March video podcast edition. This material was delivered as a live lecture at the University of Massachusetts Medical School. In this edition, we will focus on the growth hormone questions and derivatives for the USMLE Step 1 exam. So, and this is legit. A 52-year-old patient uh, presents to the office. He has type 2 diabetes. He was well-controlled, compliant with meds, um, eating well, eliminated foods with high glycemic index. And this is actually a patient of mine, exactly how he presented. Weight is down, so I ordered labs. So here's a guy who had been doing great. He comes on in. He has an A1C of 14%. That's not so good. I called the guy and found out what he was doing. He was still eating fine. Poor glycemic control. You order follow-up studies considering secondary causes. So that's kind of built into we have a diabetic. Now it's a poorly controlled diabetic. What else is going on? Which of the following is not to be expected to be associated with hyperglycemia. So this is just looking at secondary causes of, uh, of diabetes. Ectopic ACTH production will drive through cortisol uh, glucose, so hyperglycemia. Failure of enterocyte transferrin receptor. What the hell is that? Sacs leave me alone with hemochromatosis, but there it is. So hemochromatosis, failure of transferrin receptor, damages the pancreas, you can get diabetes. So secondary diabetes, I do uh, get iron studies. Somatotroph, what's that? Somatotroph, that's growth hormone, uh, somatomedins. So that can do it. Lactotroph, that's just another way for them to talk about a prolactinoma. So prolactinoma, we just talked about, does nothing with glucose. I'm concerned that's the answer. And here we go, failure of post-translation, glycosylation of the cystic fibrosis transmembrane regulator protein. So we know that cystic fibrosis through pancreatic failure, pancreatic exocrine failure can cause diabetes. That can do it. And here we go again, painful, necrotic, bronze-colored skin rash. That's the glucagonoma. The sex can't let that go either. So in this case, I have this guy with a poorly controlled diabetes, and there are other things that cause diabetes to go out of control. Here's a differential diagnosis. Uh, lactotroph doesn't do it, okay? So now also, I'm still on hyperglycemia. I know we're talking about the pituitary. We'll get there. We're still on hyperglycemia. Which of the following medications can contribute to hyperglycemia? Here, here's a situation where there are drugs that cause hyperglycemia, and you have to be familiar with them. So we have niacin and valsartan. Niacin causes, uh, I'm sorry, hyperglycemia. Uh, valsartan doesn't affect. ARBs don't affect glucose. Hydrochlorothiazide, so thiazide diuretics can cause hyperglycemia. It's a side effect. I think that also interferes with insulin release. ACE inhibitors don't. Prednisone can certainly bang up your sugar. Look, we have three different drugs that can increase your sugar. So prednisone can do it, alendronate cannot. Nifedipine does it, metoprolol, not classic, beta blockers, I think worse in intolerance too. So the answer here is really the combination. Know that niacin and hydrochlorothiazide are the agents that are associated with hyperglycemia. All right, so, uh, and this is, again, what happened. Results pending, this guy never had a headache in his life. All of a sudden, like after I see him about two weeks later, he develops a severe headache. Visual field uh, check reveals a peripheral deficit, and a head CT is obtained, and he's got this big jugundo pituitary tumor. So we know he's got a pituitary tumor, glucose is out of control, so yeah, hormonal studies are ordered. Prolactin check, that's fine, he doesn't have hypopit. Thyroid is normal. 24-hour urine cortisol is normal, and that just tells us, again, the rest of the pituitary functions are intact, and two days later, this comes back. And again, just to emphasize, we get insulin-like growth factor. That's what we get. We don't get growth hormone. You can get growth hormone, but we get insulin-like growth factor too. And this is off the charts. And this is, well, if untreated, which is the most likely to develop. So this is a guy who has a growth hormone-producing tumor presenting with headache and hyperglycemia. All right? And so what's going to develop? Which of the following is most likely to develop if we don't treat him? Cardiomyopathy. Yeah, we said that's the cause of death. Macroglossia, that happens, right, from IGF. Hypertension, sure, you can get it there. Linear bone growth, which is most likely to develop. No, because he's old. I showed you in the previous slide, he's 52. I take care of adults. A 52-year-old, he's not going to get linear bone growth. He's going to get lateral bone growth. Some of the above, all of the above. So the bottom line is, for those of you who took all of the above, you were wrong. The right answer is the sum of the above. Cardiomyopathy, macroglossia, hypertension. You do not get linear bone growth. Okay, lateral bone growth you get.
All right, so this guy undergoes a uh, transphenoidal hypophysectomy. They take out the adenoma. Subsequent testing shows the IGF level is still elevated. So he had surgery, but he still has remnants of the adenoma present. So IGF level is high. Oh, I wrote that. Microadenoma is 90% cure, macroadenoma is 50% cure. Which of the following agents would be most useful level to achieve biochemical remission of IGF and growth hormone? And this comes back to what I had asked previously. Somatostatin decreases growth hormone and thereby IGF, right? Pegvisimont is a growth hormone receptor antagonist. It can decrease IGF, but won't change growth hormone levels. And that's a subtle, delicious little question they can ask you on the boards with a whole lot of other useless options. So we started this patient on octreotide, so matostatin. That's what we're treating him with. 18 months later, he develops abdominal pain. Right? So here you have a patient on somatostatin. What's the most likely cause of the pain? Gallstones, ulcer disease, pancreatitis, hepatitis, splenic microocclusive disease, abdominal pain, microocclusive disease, you know, he's not a sickler. Drug induced hepatitis, octreotide, well, maybe, but that's not common. It's somatostatin, our body makes it. Pancreatitis, no, somatostatin turns things off, stasis, so it turns off pancreatic secretions. It inhibits, it inhibits gastrin. Decreases, so, so peptic ulcer disease is less likely. Symptomatic cholelithiasis is the only one left, and I gotta think about that. Why does he have gallstones? Because somatostatin turns everything off, in col including cholecystokinin. So cholecystokinin, so from stasis, this guy develops gallstones as a complication of uh, octreotide somatostatin treatment. So symptomatic cholelithiasis is the answer. In this question-based review, we covered a lot of territory. We reviewed secondary causes of hyperglycemia, including endocrinopathies, hemochromatosis, and pancreatic failure. We identified key medications that may be identified by their adverse effect profile, namely hyperglycemia. We saw that growth hormone adenomas may present with hyperglycemia in addition to mass effect. And finally, we touched base on the key therapies available for the adenoma, including surgery, which this patient failed, and two hormonal therapies. Growth hormone can certainly swing in a number of directions. And that will conclude this question-based review of growth hormone and related derivatives. Thank you.